um, and I can give a few remarks. Um, as you can see, Hans Ulrich is not physically present with us. We are very glad that he was able to zoom in for this incredible conversation. And we thank you for joining us for the 2022 edition of Expo Chicago, the International Exposition of Contemporary and Modern Art. I'm Kate sears Patowski, Director of Programming, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the Dialogue stage, presented in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Dialogues offers panel discussions, conversations, and provocative artistic discourse with leading artists, curators, designers, and arts professionals on current issues that engage them. Also, a special thank you to our partner, Moose, um, for helping promote our panel. Afrocobra, or the African Commune of Bad Relevant Artists, was a collective founded on the south side of Chicago in 1968. Known for creating art to address social and cultural challenges affecting the black community, Afrocobra is one of the most significant arts movements of the second part of the 20th century. Internationally renowned curator and artistic director of the Serpentine Galleries in London, Hans Ulrich Obrist will speak to the integral members of the over 50-year-old collaborative Gerald Williams, Jay Jarrell, Wadsworth Jarrell, and Sherman Beck to discuss the group's history and their individual practices seen through the lens of historic group exhibitions. Please join me in welcoming all of our panelists, both on-site and digitally. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kate, and um, uh, so so delighted to be in conversation today with Jay Watsworth, Gerald, and, and, and Sherman, uh, who are, of course, our great pioneers of the Afrikobra uh, group, but also incredible artists who are making amazing works today. So I thought for this panel, we can talk about the history, but hopefully also about the more recent work the extraordinary artists are, are doing. I was reading again the text, Edward Spriggs, uh, the then director, uh, actually, um, uh, of the um, uh, exhibitions, of the first two exhibitions of Afrikobra, um, uh, said when he said that actually two years of his museum, uh, of the studio museum in Harlem, were actually uh, dedicated to Afrikobra because for him, he said, it's the most dynamic combination of thought, talent, and commitment that we know of in the visual arts during this era of the black aesthetic in America. And of course, it's extraordinary that this uh, uh, basically uh, activity has been going on for, for 50 years. And I'm very grateful to Expo Chicago that we could bring together this panel today to Tony, to Kay, to everybody else, to my collaborator, Josh Wildig, of course, also, as Kate said, to Moose. And it's our third collaboration with the uh, Expo Chicago. We did a panel with the Harry Who, with uh, Art Green, with Gladys Nielsen and Carl Wilson a couple of years ago. We then did the marathon, the Creative Chicago Marathon, co-curated with Alison Cuddy, actually the Terra Foundation, Art Design Chicago, and the Expo collaborated on that in a display of Barbara Castell. And that is also the first time I met Gerald Williams when we uh, had a conversation for this marathon. And then during the lockdown, actually last year, um, I had a wonderful conversation with Jay and Vasquez Jarrell, uh, a, a long interview. So I'm very, very delighted that today we can have these uh, group uh, conversations. And um, before we talk about the, uh, the work you're doing now, I wanted to ask a few questions about the history. And uh, uh, of course, uh, very often it's mentioned that actually the wall of respect from uh, 1967 was somehow a really important departure point. In a way, that Africa was almost like an offspring uh, of this wall of respect. So I wanted to ask uh, Watson and Gerald maybe to tell us a little bit about the wall of respect, and particularly also as it was destroyed in 71, uh, just also maybe if you could describe it a little bit and tell us about this amazing work. Um, <clears throat> the wall of respect was... Um, Actually, it was formed by um, poets and writers mostly. Um, that was, and they still have a workshop, uh, Obasi workshop. And Obasi was is an African word that they use for the name of it. And um, as visual artists. Uh, Jeff Donaldson was uh, one of the 
founders of the Walter Respect. And he was a visual artist that precipitated the painting of the Walter Respect. So we, you know, we was the only persons that did a project was the um, visual artist. So, you know, we had several meetings um, in different places. Uh, first one was in Hyde Park and um, Hopper Court, which no longer exists. And the second, the rest of the meetings was at Mona Weaver's studio at, uh, who was an artist, and she had a gallery that we met in at 73rd and Stony Island. Um, and we met for a number of times before we came up with what we was going to do and where we was going to do it. Um, so Bill Walker, William Walker, was a mural painter who had painted several murals around Chicago, mostly on the south side and in the area of where the Wall of Respect uh, was. So he suggested that he had permission to paint a mural on a building at 43rd and Langley. And he said, offered us, he would, um, we would, he would be happy if we joined him in, in working on it. So we all agreed. And so then we knew what we was going to do and where we was going to do it. So we all go, went down to the Wall of Respect uh, to look at it and see. It was just a typical Chicago building where business is on the first floor and, and residents above. Um, it was a two-story building and there was a bar that um, was the sort of the headquarters, sort of the man, point man that uh, really gave us permission to paint on the wall although he didn't own the building, but he had a business there, and the uh, owner was absent. He was somewhere in Florida or somewhere, so uh, I'm sure he didn't care. But that's where we, uh, we would met and we strategized and planned on what we was gonna do. So in the beginning, we, after we, Bill Walker gave us the uh, okay to what we was going to do. Um, then we started planning and we decided what we was going to put on the wall. And all of the decisions was made by the Obasi group of artists who met. Um, we decided uh, to put sections we decided on seven sections in the Wall of Respect. And we had a designer named Sylvia um, Abernathy who designed the Wall of Respect. She was a designer. She was fresh out of, uh, uh, what school did she go to? Uh, Anyway, she was fresh out of design school. So she designed the wall and um, into seven sections. And she dictated the colors that was used in each section, which probably didn't, probably didn't hold up. But when artists are painting, they use any colors they wanted to use. But um, that, that was the idea. And so we chose sections, and if one, the top section on the top of the second floor, highest part of the mural, was uh, statesmen's, which included uh, politicians and uh, civil rights leaders, people from different sections, like. Uh, 
So in that section, we chose uh, Adam Clayton Powell, uh, Stokely Carmichael, um, Rap Brown, and the congressman, uh, Adam Clayton Powell, and uh, Garvey, Marcus Garvey. And the second section, this is the top of the wall, was sports. So in this, uh, which Jeff, uh, Norman Parrish, you uh, raise your hand and ask for the section that you wanted to paint. So Norman Parrish raised his hand and he took um, um, Statesman. And the next session was sports, which was Myrna Weaver took that section. Um, and there was mm, your popular athletes like uh, Jabbar, basketball player, uh, Wilt Chamberlain, um, Bill Russell, and and maybe I don't remember all of them, but most of your popular uh, sports uh, athletes. And the next section was jazz, which Jeff Donaldson chose. And some of you, you know, these sections, you couldn't put everyone in there. So you had to just pick and choose who you wanted to put in. Um, so here's included uh, people like Thelonious Monk, um, um, Annette Coleman, Lester Young, um, Nina Simone, and other popular musicians, uh, Max Roach. And then we go down to the bottom section, far left was Rhythm and Blues, which I chose to paint. And that section included Billie Holiday, Aretha Franklin, Dinah Washington, um, uh, James Brown, Oscar Brown Jr., um, Stevie Wonder, and the Miracle Miracles. And the next section from mine was religion, which Bill Walker chose to paint. And that section included uh, Reverend Cleage, um, and some of the people I can't remember, but he also included um, Elijah Muhammad, who later asked to be removed from there, from the thing. Uh, and these are great memories, and thank you so much for that. And actually, um, as you once said, that in a way, Cobra and Africa was almost like an offspring of this uh, incredible uh, of respect. I wanted to ask Jay and Gerald to maybe tell us about the very beginning of a cobra. I think it's all, and then of course how it led to Africa cobra. Because I think it's always very interesting how um, a group forms. And I was speaking the other day to the members of the Zero Group in Germany, to Günther Uecker and Heinz Mark, and some years ago Otto Pine, And I asked them how the group met, and they remembered actually a gathering in a bar in Düsseldorf where they had a dictionary and found the name. Can you tell us about the moment of epiphany, how actually it all began in, um, yeah, in, in 68, as far as I understand that uh, Jason Vatsos' studio played a very big role. So it would be great to hear about that from Jay and uh, actually, uh, yeah, maybe Faust and then from Gerard. Um, thank you for asking. Uh, Wadsworth and I had a studio um, that was, um, a good home place for the beginning of a movement. And we invited those art friends that we knew and asked them to share with expanding uh, the invitations. And folks came on Sunday afternoons and we gathered and talked about just refreshing things for black people. And 
we wouldn't really clarify where we were going and absolutely what we were doing, but we thought it was important that we gathered and that we collaborate to do something for our people, um, for us to make a history, a, a, pictor a pictorial history of what was important and keep that in our mind and give our, us a direction. We were not hardcore on any issues that we were going to deal with. We simply were gathering like family and just sharing Sunday afternoons, um, bringing our, some images that we had started weren't really clarifying exactly our direction other than it, it be comfortable to express and comfortable to observe. And it went on for a long period of time. And we sort of wondered, where are we going? Until we got an invitation to go. And, um, it was that we would be in a film at some point uh, to tell what we were doing and why we were collecting. And so, quick like a bunny, we uh, chose a posture and a subject, and that was black family. And that gave us some incentive to collaborate and to express and to contribute something from the beginning. Um, it was worthwhile that we were pushed to prepare and it gave us started and we came out of the gate with image, images that were similar and began Afro-Cobra from a visual aspect, I believe. Gerald? At a certain point, you start having flashbacks. And, and when, when that period of time comes up, the main flashback that I have is, is a day that I, January 27th, 1967, I had taken a painting down to the Art Institute that had was called the Chicago and Vicinity Show. And uh, so I took a paint, painting down there to be reviewed and so forth and with hopes of being accepted into the show. Uh, at about noon, I started seeing snowflakes. And uh, by the time I got the train back home, it was really, really snowing hard. And that day happened to be the, the worst snowstorm in the history of this city. Uh, uh, fast forward a little bit. I had a studio in a, a building that Wadsworth and, and Jay occupied. And there was no tra transportation other than walking. So I decided to walk about, about a mile and a half in, 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 in what paths, pathways there were. Police, police car stopped me and I said, where are you going? And I said, well, I, I'm going to work. I have a studio that I'm going to. And why did you stop me? Well, you resemble somebody who looks like someone, a suspect, who was carrying a blue steel revolver um, two weeks ago, six blocks away. I said, out of sight, fantastic. <laughs> Tell me more. And, you know, I had a mild complaint about that. And they called, he, the, the patrolman called his, Supervisor, supervisor came over and 
What do you got? What do you have in that in that bag? I had a little bag with brushes and paint and ink and stuff in it. He said, he said uh, "Can I take a look?" I said, "Help yourself." And he pulled out a knife about that long, mm. took out a ruler, and measured the knife. He said, an inch longer, and uh, uh, I could arrest you for having this knife. I said, I use that knife to sharpen my pencils with. Well, still, it's, it's just a little short, so you're OK. Um, that's, that's one part of this, this story. We, we did start bringing in, uh, uh, we, we, we met as a result of his having a, a studio in this building that I occupied part of on the other side. And um, at that time, I worked um, at Northeastern Illinois State College, way on the Northwest side. And, and Jeff Donaldson was on the faculty there. I was just um, part of the woodwork. Uh, and he saw, saw some of my work and said, hey, come join. Uh, there's a group of us meeting. You, you know Wadsworth and uh, you know, a few of the other people that are going there. And I told him, Jeff, I, I, I just got out of the military, and I don't join anything anymore. <laughs> and so he said, well, come on anyway. And we came and met and talked and exchanged ideas about what was going on. And, you know, as you know, Chicago, unlike today, was peaceful and quiet. But it was a hotbed of all the other stuff that was going on. So our meetings were about the things that were going on in the uh, city, political, social, and, and um, uh, the idea of coming together to so what are we going to do? We're going to join the the riots, or we're going to uh, uh, get shotguns and put in the back of our cars like everybody else. We were a little more uh, interested in in the finer things in life, the aesthetic aspects of the revolution and the. Uh, issues that were going on, uh, the war in Vietnam, and uh, the riots that were taking place on the west side. We were right, right practically on the campus of the University of Chicago, which was a safe zone, because they had, they had bunkers and all kinds of um, uh, security safeguards around the campus. Um, we um, were meeting under circumstances that were kind of like, like um, interesting. Um, the very first painting that I brought in was was a um, a painting of of a um, of a police car being um, torched by panthers. Um, and uh, I think was kind of tame by uh, uh, standards that, that later developed in, in how, you approach, how you approach expressing rage. Um, and then one thing led to, the, to, to another, as Jay said. We did, um, uh, we did compile some principles that, um, that we decided to adhere to and developed uh, um, uh, 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 paintings utilizing those principles of, of un unlimited use of color, lost and found line, um, mimesis at midpoint, um, and uh, um, frontal, frontality of, of confronting the viewer. 
So most of the work during that period was confrontational in, in, uh, from the point of view of, of the image facing the uh, viewer. Um, the um, uh, hardest part to really come to grips with was the um, the idea of, of visibility. You know, when you've lived in a culture for so long where where you're virtually invisible to the mainstream culture, we decided to, to do work that expressed our feelings and ways of thinking about gaining visibility. And we looked to the community to an extent of seeing that color was an important part of fashion in those days. Um, we, we developed the main concept that a lot of people associate with Africa over, over the years was the use of, of color that we call Kool-Aid colors, um, uh, not having anything to do with, with the drink, but um, uh, you know, we, we spell the word Kool-Aid differently. And that's kind of like uh, something that resonated even today. Uh, there's enough work around for you to see that, uh, that, that gives you an idea. I don't know if any slides are going to going to uh, be looped through, but uh, you can see some of the work that was done then and, and some more recent work. Um, and, and there's work, I think, throughout the, uh, the expo, both here and at the uh, Peninsula Hotel and at uh, Kavi Gupta Gallery. Um, and then, then, of course, you can grab copies of Wadsworth's book on Africa over, and there's another, another book that goes into a lot more detail uh, on the formalities of the, uh, of, of, of the, the organization. Thank you so much, uh, Gerald, and thank you so much, Jay and Wadsworth. And before bringing in Sherman, when we're going to talk about the exhibition, because Sherman joined about two years later, and before then discussing the shows, I had one more question for Jay, for Watsworth, and for Gerald about the beginnings of Afrikober, because I spoke to Arthur Jaffer a couple of months ago, and Arthur Jaffer, the artist and filmmaker, raised this question, which seems so deeply connected to, to, um, to Afrikober, when he said, how might one develop a specifically black visual aesthetic, which is equal to the power, to beauty and alienation of black music in, in US culture. And it's something you all spoke quite regularly about, the connection to, to rhythm, the connection also to music. Um, and of course, that also leads us to one other aspect because you've just outlined many different aspects of the manifesto um, in terms of uh, uh, certain of the rules of the manifesto. But besides the music, there was one, one more thing which has of course to do also with the way how music is distributed and how it is accessible. Um, and I found it always so fascinating how you early on uh, emphasized the importance of these prints and um, uh, of art for all in a way, of making art accessible beyond the gallery system for, for many more people. So it's kind of two questions in one uh, for Jay, for Watsworth and for Gerald. <laughs> One of, the, one of the things that I would challenge you to do in, in this, you know, 50 years ago there wasn't, there wasn't such a thing as YouTube or, or Google. I would challenge you, challenge you to, to Google the term black art. And see what you come up with. Translate black, black art 
into any language you can think of, uh, non-English non language, and translate black art. You can see a lot of um, photographs, black and white photographs of, of, of maybe witchcraft and, and um, uh, visions of, of um, uh, uh, dark, uh, mundane thoughts and ideas, all in black and white. Uh, change and, and, and Google Afri African American art and there's a total different set of, of images that you're going to be faced with. And it'll blow your mind the extent to which that change from English to other languages, Chinese, uh, 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 Thai, whatever you can think of. Um, and, and you can get an idea of, of, of the impact that the, the uh, color and imagery uh, is associated with, with language. The same is, is, I guess, may be true with music. If you Google black music, you're going to find one set of images translated into other languages. You're going to find different references. So, so I'm saying that, that basically the... Um, the, and of course, if you Google Afrikober, you're going to find a whole panoply of images and and Google's idea of of um, how Afrikober has evolved to other artists and to other parts of, of of artistic expressions all over the country. Um, I would say also that we, in order to have that diversity, uh, that we reach, we knew we needed to reach back to the beginning. And the beginning is where our ancestors uh, would portray um, the beauty of their different country lands um, in their appearance, their costume, their important figures that they give reverence to. Um, all this is to be shared and brand new for America. So it was brand new to us because we had not been taught with um, those references um, unless you seek them. Um, but it was beautiful that we would come together and bring imagery, bring history, um, see how it can affect our intentions to create and include uh, somewhat where, of what we are learning and find it beautiful to expand um, our voice, um, our work, um, to to make it, make it fresh and brand new. Um, and this is how we shared with our children, because my son was an Afro-Cobra mascot. He was there from the crib, the walking, talking. He, was, he knew Afro-Cobra like it was going to prayer meeting, you know, and we weren't going to a lot of prayer meeting, right? So it was, we were sharing some newfound things with newfound brothers and sisters that became family to us as we would come together on Sundays and bring bits and pieces of what we had discovered. And Wadsworth Jr who we called Fats. He was just that little fat guy at a while. And he would be toddling back and forth. He was very familiar with all of these, these artists who came to his home and did beautiful things. And so 
this is why we thought of our brethren that were partaking in this venture with us as a family, extended family. And it, it's beautiful that you grow. We discovered, we were discovering with the contributions of one another. We didn't know about this uh, tribe that was in one location that w carried staffs dressed in a certain attire that had meaningful patterns and indications of uh, of a, a statement in in the garment in the staff in their home in the the door of their home you know it it was deep it was very very deep and we took it slow deep and repeatedly every Sunday and brought in things that had influenced us in our work and shared it. So it's, um, it was a long, slow process. We weren't in a hurry. We had no idea what the outcome would be. But um, at some point, we had to act. And it was great that we got the foot, you know, from some very fine um, the TV station that thought they had room for our ideas and we might want us to do step one there. And that's, you know, you take it slow and, and, and you t do it with respect and you do it with what ifs. And we did our what ifs together. We, we came naked. We brought, we brought work that was unfinished and so often we know of artists that do their work like this, because it isn't about presenting to you till it's done in a knockout. But it's when you are developing something, you are looking for truth and invention. And it was beautiful to have been truthful together with unfinished work and somebody. And that's when we started critique. You know, and we actually said, what if you included, you know, the this, that, and the other that might be helpful to solve something fresh? And so it's all about trust and obey, you know. Yeah, this old, old church song, Trust and Obey, you know? So that's where we were. And um, always enlightened. You come away enlightened. You didn't come away mad because that good part of this that you had was hitting a direction that might not be so impactful to a, a, a mass of people. And that's, you know, you took your... You took your um, opportunity to lead and to learn as you go. And every weekend was very impactful. We just came together, brought stuff, and came away with refreshing ideas, particularly when we decided principles were of import and the Afrocobra had principles that you applied. Um, and the Kool-Aid colors were for cool, C-O-O-L, because everything we were doing was so cool. <laughs> so it helped those who didn't understand that element yet. Uh, to be able to embrace it because we got their attention. 
Um, so there's a lot of fun, a lot of humor is to Avracobra as well. It's kind, gentle, uh, kick butt, and also, also impactful. And positive. You often said that it wasn't a protest, it's about giving solution, uh, uh, an explosion, Jay, you said, of positive energy. And I was wondering, um, what's Ross, if you wanted to thank so much, uh, um, Gerald and Jay, for this great answer. And I wanted to ask you, what's Ross, if you had anything to add to this question also of Arthur Jay, for how might one develop a specifically black visual aesthetic equal to the power and beauty uh, alienation of black music in U.S. culture. Um, if if um, people have in the audience have heard us talk before, some of the things we're going to say is repetitive mm -hmm. because it's things that we did. But all of us in the group uh, had. Um, training in Western procedures uh, and went to prestigious schools. Uh, all of us was associated with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago or, or the uh, School of Design. So we had to, what we call, unlearn some of the things we had learned in school and think revolutionary. So we took another approach <clears throat> to making art, which was, which we call revolutionary and we called it black art, which is explained as a, a non-Western approach to making art. This was our aim and our aim was, of course, to create a new language um, which we label a black aesthetic. Um, and this is what we focus on. Uh, and we was meeting for a couple of years before we ever uh, had a major show. We had some sort of local shows in Chicago at different places, but... Um, the first major show was, of course, at the Studio Museum in Harlem, which the show traveled. But we we would meet every Sunday. Um, we'd meet probably about 12 o'clock noon, and we'd end the meetings 5 or 6 o'clock in the afternoon. And we just brainstormed. We talked about in and everything, politics, um, art, other artists, uh, Picasso's uh, sculpture downtown in the plaza. We talked about any and everything, all kinds of artists. And we decided <clears throat> what we didn't want to do. And then we focused on what we wanted to do, um, is making art with a non-Western approach, uh, which we achieved. And um, that's uh, sort of where we, we went, you know, so. And the early paintings, we evolved as we, as, you know, as the years went by. Um, the very first paintings, uh, slightly different from what we would be doing 10, 20 years later, and now it's almost 50 years later, and the work have evolved, but it still have some of the elements of the beginning paintings. It still has um, Kool-Aid colors, we still use that, and, uh, and this thing of uh, uh, Mimis is at midpoint, which is which is um, a, a place between pure realism and pure abstraction. So we went in the middle of that. That's what the uh, means at midpoint mean. So we're still doing things like that, but the paintings has, the art has revolved. 
since since then, you know. Thank you so much, Ross Ross. And um, I wanted to ask Sharman um, uh, a few questions. Uh, Sharman, you said in uh, interviews that actually uh, it really all began with you meeting Jeff Donaldson. And um, of course, that was such an important encounter for for all of you. So it would be great to hear how you, through that encounter, came uh, to Africobra. And I was also very interested in, as mentioned before, in this idea of affordable reproductions, art for all, uh, because that is something which really for you was, was very important at the beginning uh, of, uh, of, of, of joining the family, as you call it. You said that you felt quite immediately you had joined the family. It would be great to hear from you about that. Well, you're correct that uh, Jeff Donaldson introduced me to the group. Uh, I had just gotten out of the Army, it was about 1966, and I was walking around uh, in the neighborhood, and I met this guy, it was, it was Jeff. He saw some of my work and decided uh, to invite me to a meeting. Now, I was not a part of the Wall of Respect. I never even saw the Wall of Respect, and that, that's something that I regret. I, I just did not get down there while it was still uh, operating. But once I did go to a meeting uh, of the Africa Cobra group, it was something different about it. I had a little bit of a rebellion in my spirit at that time. <laughs> not that I don't have it now. But uh, at the time, I met this group, and they were looking to build a new, not a new aesthetic, but to bring out an aesthetic that was designed by us, for us. Now, it reminds me of a, a, a clothing line called FUBU, for us, by us. And when I felt that vibe, it was like I found a home. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why I wanted to be a part of Africobra. Now, I wasn't active very long, maybe about four years. Most of the group moved out of Chicago. I stayed, and uh, there were a lot of things in my life at the time that kept me from being really an active member of uh, Africobra. People on the stage here sort of found me like a prodigal son, brought me back in the group. And uh, recently, Gerald found me on the side of the road distressed. Yeah, I ran into a problem with the car, and, and uh, he was driving by and picked me up. So it was, it's, it's this kind of thing that lets me know that I should never or never have strayed away because they keep bringing me back. <laughs> and so... Um, my uh, feeling about that is that an artist is never finished product. We're all works in progress. You know, I'm, I'm sitting up here talking about uh, like I'm a new guy in the group or uh, a young person in the group. The group is 55 years old almost. So there's nothing new about any of us. It's just that I was one of the later, later ones getting in the group. Um, they mentioned something about uh, a first big show in a studio museum in Harlem. Well, that show was called um, Ten in Search of a Nation. The group was fully fleshed before I showed up. I was number nine. And so there was one other guy that came in after I did, and that made the 10, which I thought was a, a really good number. It was, well, I had very little to do with it except being welcomed into the group and being part of that first show. I don't know what else um, I might have to say about that. Did you have a question specific? to uh, my involvement. Yeah, I, I, uh, thank you very much for this great answer. And I wanted to ask you to tell us more about 
these exhibitions because I read in interviews about your uh, yeah your memories of that first exhibition at the um, um, actually at the Studio Museum, the Africa Ra One. Um, and I just wanted to um, ask you to tell us about your memories of these of these shows because at the end of the day we have a few images of such exhibitions. A lot has been written, but there is nothing more wonderful than actually have memories of, 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 of artists of, um, about such historic exhibitions. So it would be great to hear more about, about this first show and actually about all three shows. And actually... Well, 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 you know, okay. when, when, when you go to New York, you, you, you expect it to have a very short life. Uh, uh, professionally uh, 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 and otherwise. But it was, it was an exhibition that, that really gave us a big bump uh, because the, the Studio Museum, as you know, was, was, uh, was built in Harlem on 125th and 5th Avenue as maybe this is not the right choice of word, but as an appeasement for artists, black artists in New York, uh, who were, were maybe complaining about not being recognized in the you know, main, uh, main venues there. And our exhibition was one of the first, one of the first to uh, show at the Studio Museum, thanks to uh, Edward Spriggs, who had attended a conference here in Chicago of, of black artists, it was CONFAB, a conference on black, uh, black art. And um, he was invited to come to, one of, one, to the studio and uh, really liked what he saw and uh, ushered, in, uh, ushered us into the, um, into the museum. Um, it, it was, um, uh, I think, in, in June, June, May or June of 1970, 70, 71, uh, something like that, but. 67. Yeah, it was in 1970. 1970, okay. Um, you, you didn't, go ahead. There, there, uh, let's just look back just a little before uh, talking about our presentation. In forming um, uh, the group, we always wanted to bring to it any expertise you might have or any energy that you might include in the group that may be helpful to us all. And um, some while before my joining in the group, um, I had been taught by a dear friend who was basically an artist or, or advising artist, her, her, her husband who was a musician, um, but about publicity. And publicity is really, really a part attached to your hip when you're going into uh, a new avenue that you need to make sure that people know what you're doing and that you're there. And that was something that I had sort of played with before um, and had helped, it had been very helpful to me for people to remember something that had been done that I um, performed. So uh, when we gathered together, we, we talked about what can you contribute and I thought publicity. And so they said, okay, that's your game. And it was everything we do, I write it up, send it off, make sure the proper people know about it and that what we're doing, because they don't know when you're creating something. You need to let them know, get ready for this. And so that was my position in in Africa, to always make sure that we acknowledged what we were doing, what the path was, where we had been, and what successes we had had thus far. And so when we got ready for 
Afrocopa won to show at, with, with Spriggs in uh, Studio Museum in Harlem. Um, all the publicity was out to all the, the avenues there in New York and where, elsewhere where anyone really had some history um, that they'd be aware that this was happening. And um, Afrocobra being, uh, a, a, you know, very fresh, uh, sent out the stuff. People showed up, and um, you know, greeted us in mass. Uh, I'll never forget that opening. It had pounds in your heart when you were in this group because there was a group that had been performers that infiltrated the whole group of us as we were hailing this Afrocobra. And they, I can't remember their name, but anyway, they did a thump, 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 and your heart thumped because it was so successful. And they were really dancers and music, you know, singer musicians. And they made us feel so welcome. It was like a chant going on. And we were all in this group, and it was, it was so relevant. And when the, the, the evening was over, and you picked up the papers, by Wednesday, I think it was, there was a publication that said, Big Bad Relevance was the title of it. To this day, I keep it. it. It makes my heart just really pound because this promoter um, uh, of, of news had made this a major, um, a major element that had occurred in New York and had spoken to us and hailed us on time right away, what was still in the minds of all and didn't need pictures to make it happen. He spoke about it in such a, a, a manner that, that really gave us a, a kick right out of um, the first presentation. And so that kind of thing was a fortunate thing that happened to us. Um, and there are all kinds of contributions that could be made in just the group, just things you know, and, and make it to make it go. So that I, I'd like to share with you. Do Thank you, Jane. Uh, and you, of course, uh, told me when we spoke uh, over Zoom last summer that it was like a wake up time. I, I was wondering if Sherman wanted to tell us some memories of the exhibitions, of these three exhibitions. I have a memory of one exhibition that was at the Studio Museum in New York. Uh, I think that was the first big exhibition of Afrocobra. I almost did not make it. I can remember that uh, everyone had left Chicago to go fix up the museum to put the artwork in. And I came into a few bucks. And just beforehand, and I, in those days, you could just go to the airport and get on a plane. <laughs> and I, got, I went to the airport and got on a plane. It was about, uh, I arrived in New York around midnight. Arriving in New York about midnight, and I got on a city bus in New York around midnight and went looking for a place to stay. I went to the, uh, I, I know I was past Wilt Small's place. It was called Small's Paradise or something like that. I just remember hearing about a place like that. And I went to the YMCA. Um, at that time, I was not an old man. I was a young man. <laughs> Innocent looking. And the guy at the desk looked at me and said, you don't want to be here. <laughs> it was just like that. So I. I walked down the street and found a room, and uh, the next morning, I caught up with the group. They were 
already at the museum fixing the place up. That's my memory of uh, getting there. Now, once there, and the show opened, and I can remember uh, being treated really well by our host. We all found places to stay. They found places for us to stay that night, uh, the next night, and took us around to parties, went to a restaurant, and had a real good time. Even had a, um, I don't know if it was Ed or somebody else. We went someplace, and the guy gave us all uh, African carvings. I still have it to this day. And well, after that, it was just a matter of uh, coming home. Now, that, that's the only thing I can remember about the, the trip, except that I almost got run over by a car. <laughs> New York is faster than Chicago, believe it or not, in, in terms of the traffic. But uh, other than that, I just remember having a good time and uh, being there, putting the show on the walls. That, that was kind of it for me. Thank you so much, Sherman. We, I know we have um, very exciting questions from the audience. So I will have one last question for you all, and then we will open it up. Um, my last question um, is uh, about what's happening now in your studios. Because when I visited um, your studio, uh, actually, this uh, Watsworth and Jay, last summer, I, you know, I asked you about all the works. You know, we discussed Jay's revolutionary suit. Uh, but then I suddenly saw all these new works where you both actually work between painting and sculpture. I know also from the conversation with Gerald we had that there are so many exciting things happening in the work and uh, uh, the same for Sherman. So I wanted to ask you to tell us about what's on now, what you're working on, maybe also about the future. Because I remember that um, during the marathon we did with um, uh, Expo um, a couple of years ago, uh, Swell and Rocker, whom I would like to remember here, uh, a wonderful Swell and Rocker, asked Gerald and actually the other panelists, do you have a project in mind to do in the future? So it's really a question to end really on the present, what you're working on right now, and maybe also a project which isn't finished yet, maybe an unrealized project, a project you want to realize in the future. Shall we begin with Gerald? There's always something percolating <laughs> in, 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 in the world of art. If, if it's not percolating, then, then you're not alive. As a matter of fact, um, uh, the future is now as far as two years ago. This, mm -hmm. this is the future of two years ago, three years ago. Uh, there's a painting that I'm not sure where it is. Um, either Kavi Gupta or out in, 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 um, at, at the gallery on Elizabeth or out uh, in the booth. But it's, it's a painting that, that I titled, When Will It Ever End? It's, it's a painting with images of 40, 46 African-American men and women who were killed by police around, around the country in different locations. Um, the question, is, and it begs the question, when will it ever end? When will that, that, um, that wanton massacre virtually end of innocent people being killed by police or otherwise? Um, the the um, first image is it is is a, of Emmett Till. Emmett Till was a schoolmate of mine. We went to the same uh, uh, elementary school, uh, and our paths crossed just momentarily at the end of the summer. He was. Um, he was set back a year. Had it not been for his being set back, his mother may not have sent him down to Mississippi. And, and uh, he met the unfortunate circumstance of being, being lynched. 
Now, the, 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 the images in the photograph are only of the eyes of those victims. Uh, the, um, uh, from, from, from the nose up. And, and the thought occurs, you know, when you, when you leave this planet or this world, you see either a loved one, a friend, but with very few exceptions in, in the images in this, in this painting, who, whose last view of this world was of a policeman who serves and protects. And the eyes may or may not tell you how, what, how they felt, what they were thinking, but just the image of, of, of their murderer, virtually. Uh, it's, it's, I, I, I don't find in any of my work striking unless 50 years pass. And then I've kind of like uh, gotten used to seeing it. But, but if you get a chance to see it, it may be in, in, the, ex, in, in the expo. Um, that's my very latest uh, work. There's another piece that I'm working on of Paul Robeson. And you all know who Paul Robeson mm. was. It's still, it's still brewing, so. Thank you so much, Gerald. Jay, do you wanna go next? Yes. Um, we are a mixture of all of our experiences. Um, I have gained from Africobra to think of the power of positivity. And um, I'm um, very positive in my direction and in what I share with my children. Though we know of the experiences that um, are also elements of our existence, but um, we must go forward with uplift and with empowerment uh, with the raising of youngsters, they have to have a vision of future, and that is very, very important. Um, so it's with strength and power that we exist. We know of some of the concerns, many of them, too many for our people. But there is much power and positivity and hell-bentness. So we can give, we can spread more joy than we spread fear. And that's helpful to empowerment. So as a mama child, that's my, my gift to my young and my brethren. Uh, forward, up. I'm good with that. Thank you so much, Jay. And what's for us? Um, the things I created as a young man, uh, now that I'm an old man, <laughs> I don't think the same way I did. Let me put it this way. Um, when I was 30, I don't... And now I'm 90, I don't think the same way. 
And if I did, something would, I need to check my stuff if I'm still relating to it. <laughs> so, um, what, I'm, what I'm doing now is so many things in my head that I'm doing and so much material I have laying around my studio. I, I, I haven't gotten around to like sculpture. I have cedar wood I bought at least four or five years ago and I've only touched it but I haven't had time to you know that's a different that's a different way of working when I you know, when I start working with the sculpture, it's different from painting, so I have to be in another kind of uh, mood to do it. And uh, I haven't got around to it. And uh, one thing I started working on when I lived in New York, and we moved to Cleveland about 12 years ago from New York, um, I'm working on something that I call American fetish, which is gangsters. Uh, America, uh, everybody else can't get enough of gangster movies. It's just like Al Capone movie. Every movie star that you can think of was making Al Capone movies. Back in the 30s all the way up to, you see, Robert De Niro making it in in the later years, in the 90s, you know. So anyway, I working on a group of gangsters. This included black and white gangsters. Uh, that's something I'm working on. And I have some, again, some other kind of sculptural things. I've got a bunch of material dominating my studio that I haven't got around to. You know, and I, I want to do a few of those sculptural kind of things. And my sculpture tend to be abstract, different from my paintings in a way, but you know it's my work. But uh, it just a lot of things I just haven't got around to that is in my head. And, and I'm always, like right now, I'm bogged down with a commission that's going to take me a few more months to finish, uh, and, and you know, and so I, I can't concentrate on really what I want to do. This is something someone else wanted me to do, and also he dictated what he wanted. It's musicians, and he dictated what musicians he wanted. And normally I don't work like that. Uh, um, th this is probably one of the first or maybe the second individual that I've done a, a commission for. I've done commissions for, you know, competition for commissions that go in buildings and things, but uh, hardly any for um, individual. But this is an individual uh, I've been doing business with for 30 years, so you know, have to had to make an exception. But anyway, it's dominated my time. I can't get to all of these things I was just talking about that I want to do. Uh, this I'm doing because he want me to do it. I, I don't necessarily want to do it. The things I want to do, I can't get around to right now. So that's that's where I am. Thank you so much, Ross and Sherman. Well, uh, G Gerald mentioned uh, working on a piece that dealt with just the eyes. And it just so happens that I've been working on some pieces where the eyes are the focal point. Uh, the, the painting is around the eyes, not necessarily uh, portraits. As a matter of fact, in, in some instances, the eyes are just isolated. That, that's just one thing that, you know, shows some kind of synchronicity there. But uh, the one piece that I'm working on now, and I, I don't generally do this, I'm working on a portrait of, of, a, of a lady. And, uh, oh, the lady is uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. And why did I choose Fannie Lou Hamer? 
I, I chose her because she's like a warrior in a house dress. Mm-hmm. And uh, I didn't know a lot about her until I, I, I mean, I knew of her. But I saw a documentary recently. And so I, I looked it up and uh, what she represented, uh, it, it, was, it was just kind of blowing me away, all the information that, that came back to me, the stuff that she had to deal with and live through. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of portraits of a lot of the civil rights leaders uh, during the period. And the civil rights leaders weren't necessarily my heroes. It was the rebels. But she falls into that category of a real rebel working within the system. And that's kind of occupying my that's occupying my uh, spiritual strength right now. Thank you so much, uh, Sharm, and thank you all so much. The moment is now to open it up for audience questions. I think Kate is going to uh, read those questions. But before doing that, I wanted to ask you all to give a very big round of applause for Jay, for Watsos, for Gerald, and for Carla. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Um, I was wondering how you actually came up with the name Afro-Cobra, or is part of it an acronym, the Cobra part? Your, your group kind of reminds me of the Harry Who group because you all feed, you have so many similarities in your lifestyles, and you feed off of one another and you share with one another. So I was just wondering where Afro-Cobra came up, um, how you put it together. We, we started off with uh, COBRA, Coalition of Black Revolutionary Artists. And then later we became uh, African COBRA. And we just shortened the African and put Afri COBRA. And you know, the same people, but the sort of the, you know, things, uh, it's semantics, the words change, you know, but it's, it's the same, same thing, but. Hi, thank you so much. <clears throat> this has been really enlightening and inspiring. Um, Sherman, you said you were cutting out of the army in '66 or '67. Were you in Were you in Vietnam? And did the Vietnam War um, play any role in what y'all were doing or how you were thinking? Not really. Okay. What happened? Um, I just have to be drafted into the army. Uh, 1964, '66, I came home. But uh, I guess through some luck on my part, I tested well enough so that they sent me to a school where I would not, could not be sent into a combat area. Was there another part to that question that I didn't answer? Okay. Hi, thank you so much for this amazing talk. Um, my question is regarding one of the points that you uh, brought up where you mentioned that you guys came up with certain principles of the group. I think, Jay, you mentioned that. I'm curious to know what kind of these, what, what were these principles and how did you build them? How did you put them together? Because more the people are harder to get things together, right? It's, it's a little difficult to get everybody on top of things. So I'm curious to know a little bit about these principles that you made. No, we, we put the, uh, the first principle was introduced by a, a fabric designer who started off with Afri Cobra, but he, he never, he left, you know, early. Uh, Robert Page. And he introduced 
Kool-Aid colors. And it was sort of funny at first when he said it to us. And it was related to the bright colors that African Americans was wearing in the 60s. And they called them Kool-Aid colors. This, this is the first principle. And then we just started adding other principles on later. There's a concept of lost and found line, where line and a composition may start somewhere and disappear and is taken up and carried throughout the, uh, the, the, the work. Uh, my, my Mises at Midpoint, which Wadsworth mentioned a little while ago, is, is a point between abstraction and realism which is, is kind of like their, their references throughout African, uh, uh, the sculpture mainly, where, where an object looks like a person, but in, in, in reality, but it's halfway between a, a, an abstraction of that object and, and realism. Uh, and, and the line, there's a line between, but it gets blurrier, blurred, uh, depending on which direction you, you move. So the, the extent rendering of an object, painting of an object, may be a face, but the face and the face is, is not naturalistic. The, 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 the features, the forms may be there. But it's treated in, in, in a way that's more abstract. So that would lend it to you know, being at one end of this, this spectrum. Thank you so much, Gerald. And thank you to everyone that attended this panel and for sticking around a, a little bit longer than expected. Um, I know Hans Ulrich was very excited to talk to you all, uh, Gerald, Jay, Wadsworth, and Sherman. Um, and we really appreciate you sharing just your legacy and what you're working on now. Um, we're just so appreciative for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.